welcome back, everybody. It's another great day in the nonprofit world, the sector that we all love, and really an important topic today, key elements of top grant wins. Amanda Stonerock is going to share with us all of her amazing insight. Hey, Amanda, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me today. I'm really excited to have you because grants are one of those like mysterious things and i think that when we start out we're just like we just will get all these grants we'll have all this money and then it's like wah, wah. doesn't always right. happen does it yep <laughs> exactly <laughs> well you're gonna set us straight give us some great ideas help us to navigate this world that we hear so much about and yet we don't know a lot about it. And so Amanda Stonerock, CEO and founder of St Stonerock, um, I think this is going to be really cool. I, I can't wait to talk to you. Another thing that I can't wait to share with you is the amazing support that our sponsors give us. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, 180 Management Group, Fundraisers Friday, our new Friday show, your part-time controller and nonprofit thought leader. These are the folks that support us day in and day out. We also have this amazing cohort of, of co-hosts. Say that fast three times. Not so easy. Um, they come from all over the country, super diverse in thought, action, and deed. Things that they do, the, the clients, the, the sector that they work in, just amazing. And so I hope that you've been able to get to know them and, and uh, learn from them as well. Okay, Amanda Stonerock. Stone Rock Business Solutions. Talk to us about what you do and more importantly, where you are. Yeah, I am based in Billings, Montana, but I have an amazing group of uh, team members that are all over the world. So I launched this uh, business back in 2021, trying to help nonprofits and small businesses uh, create some sustainability and structure to their grant writing, um, strategic planning, and fundraising. And so we help uh, lots of businesses who are working through fiscal sponsorships with a nonprofit, as well as nonprofits who are um, either dipping their toes in the sand of trying to learn how do I get into the grant world, or how do I diversify what my fundraising looks like, um, and so we we love what we do. We've got, um, like I said, people all over the, the world. I've got somebody who's over in the Ukraine that helps me a ton. Um, someone who is uh, in Chicago and in New Orleans, Spokane. So we're really all over, but like I said, based in Montana. I love it. I think that's fabulous. Well, you know, I, I think one of the things that I've learned um, from, or I, I, I knew it, but I think it's just been amplified that I've learned from my co-hosts because they come from all over the country. And so, you know, they, they bring with them their, their um, regional culture, their language, their accents, um, their temperament. Um, and then, you know, different parts of the world behave differently just because of the environment, right? Like Absolutely. in the summer, I'm in, I'm based in Phoenix. Well, we sure as heck don't do anything in the summer. We're like, mold, <laughs> you know? and then you, I, you, I would imagine being in Billings, you kind of have that opposite situation in the winter. Right. And then this is your glory. These are your glory days, right? Exactly. Exactly. Like, I think it's a cool thing to recognize. And as vast as this country um, is and how vast the world can be, I think it's a, a neat thing to kind of observe that and look, and especially in the nonprofit sector. I mean, it's it's a fascinating thing. Well, let's get into the the business of the day, and that's really talking about grants. I, I started off the show um, saying, you know, it's kind of a mystery, and what do you do, and how does it work? And I don't know about you, but I feel like a lot of us think we hear the word grant, and we're like fairy godmother tapping us and money's going to fall from the sky and we'll be like, woohoo! doesn't work that way, does it? It does not work that way at all. <laughs> so talk to us about this concept of a grant quality assurance review. I really yeah, like it. This is something that I started working with some really established nonprofits mm -hmm. who have a pretty diversified process in their fundraising 
and they could raise money through capital campaigns and and they could do you know these grassroots things but they were really really struggling with translating their message into the grant world and so that don't have a director of development on staff who is familiar with grants because it's such a totally different world like you said Mm -hmm. it's kind of the unicorn um Mm -hmm. raising profession and so what I started to do is give me your information and show me what you have in your grants so that I can help you target your language in the story that adheres to the requirements of the grant application, um, to the requirements of an RFP proposal, and just making sure that it's, um, you know, crossing all the T's and dotting the I's uh, as opposed to just submitting stuff and and hoping for the win. And so that's what the quality assurance is. And that's on the front end. And then we also do things on the back end because we know that uh, you're not going to get a yes every single time. (laughs) Wait, what? (laughs) What happens? What do we do? So part of that quality assurance is going back to you know, the funder or to the state or whoever you're applying for this grant and asking what could we have done differently in order to improve for next year. So it's creating that long term sustainability and growth and learning for each of the organizations so that they can have kind of this comprehensive package that could be a win in the next six, nine, 12 months. Mm -hmm. So that's what that quality assurance review is. You know, I love this because uh, just, I think, yesterday or the day before, there was an interesting op-ed piece in the Chronicle of Philanthropy about a CEO. And I don't know if you read that or not, but, you know, they had been um, part of an inquiry about a major, major funder that was not exactly identified, but probably one of the most prominent female funders um, of our time, if maybe ever, in this country. And she felt like her institution was going to get this this funding opportunity, be part of a grant cycle, and then crickets. And she has labored over this. She feels responsible. She feels dread. She feels disappointment, anger. It's like the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, Seven Stages of Grief, right? I mean, yes. it was, it's a heartbreaking fascinating read. I I recommend it to everyone, but it, it seems to me now that I'm talking to you, holy moly, if she'd had maybe this piece of review, maybe it would be a different situation. What do you think? Yeah. And you know, I haven't seen the article, but thanks for the tip. I'll definitely be pulling that up. I'm sure it's in my email, but I think the biggest thing is, a lot of organizations try to fit themselves into um, a goal or a priority for a funder without really digging into the intricate details. So one of the other things that we do, particularly if it's a foundation that we're applying to, we review the 990. And so that we get an idea of what they've been funding in the past, because sometimes, you know, we think we fit into what they're trying to do, but when we dig into who they funded in the past, it, it it doesn't quite fit. And I think that some people kind of skip that step, which is a huge no-no in my opinion. Um, and then it's also that relationship building. So I have a lot of organizations that come to me and they say, I have this opportunity, but it's done in 30 days. And so I have to have that really hard conversation with them that asks, you know, have you done your legwork in order to be there? And it's not just the writing and getting all of your documents in a row, but have you reached out to the funder? Have you created a relationship? Have you reviewed to see if your project is even something um, that's on their, their scope or their priority for that particular funding cycle? Right. You know, I really appreciate you saying this because I feel like when um, I speak with nonprofits and it's all over this country, they confuse the notion of a funder having lots of money with a funder having a lot or little interest, right? Like right. where do they fund? It's just because you have a lot of money doesn't mean you just throw it all out there and oh, right. hope something sticks. And I don't know about you, but I feel like this is a missing link because we get 
uh, we're, we're kind of seduced by the notion of lots of money, meaning lots of opportunity, but we don't set the expectation or understand what the expectation, maybe that's exactly. it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, too many nonprofits throw spaghetti at a wall to see what yeah. sticks. Yeah. And it, it, um, it wastes time and energy, but mm-hmm. it also, you know, kind of how you mentioned with that article, it, there's emotional feelings behind it when yeah. you don't get approved. And, and so yeah. it, it causes, you know, some oh. folks to not continue to go and grow and, and mm-hmm. create a package that mm-hmm. um, could get them funded the next time. So let's talk about the LEIs, the letter of interest. I mean, you mentioned something about the relationship building. Um, and I want to also tack on a piece to that. So let's start with the letter of interest. What is it? So a letter of interest is kind of a pre-application. So I'm starting to see this a lot more with nonprofits um, who tend to get quite a few applications during their grant cycle. And so it's a mini application. Sometimes um, it is just a letter, create a letter meeting these requirements, you know, tell us who you are, what your mission is, what your goals are, submit it to us, and then we will invite you into our application. Uh, that's being streamlined a little bit with uh, advancements in technology where it, it's a mini application online where, you know, you fill in all the information about your organization and then the review committee can then invite you to their full application cycle. And even when an organization doesn't have that, I always recommend either doing um, a phone letter of interest, you know, or just an email just saying, I, we're looking at your application. We're really interested. We feel like we fit into your goals and priorities. And this is, mm-hmm. you know, what I'm thinking. Can you tell me if this fits? Because we don't want to bog down funders. We don't want them to think, you know, this process is so arduous and time consuming. Mm -hmm. And so how that that's part of that relationship building. Um, The other thing is it could, you know, potentially uh, help an organization tip off a funder about something that might be a priority in the future. So those are why I recommend kind of that process and letter of interest. Okay, so this then is the perfect segue to my next question, and that is, we all are seeing these portals. I mean, we've had guests on the nonprofit show that are programming companies that have actually designed software to help manage uh, funders, processes, and all this. Yep. And so I think a lot of folks, myself included, I probably am like, oh, well, if it's online, how do I create a relationship? Because we're not going out. And of course, I think this is a reverberation of COVID. We're not seeing the program officers in our communities. They're not coming on tours. We're not bumping into them at other events, right? So how do we we create that more human connection when everything is, is more digitally based? You know, I'm finding really great success with picking up the phone, honestly. I mean, I'm going old school. That's a hair on fire moment. Good right. for you. <laughs> um, you know, technology is there where you can find somebody's phone number. Honestly, yeah. you just might have to take the extra two steps to dig. Um, <laughs> the other thing, again, looking through 990s, looking at who's on the board of directors. If you can't get the program director directly, you could probably find somebody to get to them. And that effort um, could save you hours and hours and hours from going through the grant writing process. And so um, I think picking up the phone, uh, scheduling, you know, a Zoom or a Teams or some sort of online (laughs) is key. Um, but just having that uh, verbal communication, I think, mm-hmm. uh, is important. Even if there's a portal, you know, you turn in online, do a follow up before that. Yeah. Uh, you know, just say, hey, I, I'm getting ready to submit this or, or say you've submitted it already. Pick up the phone and say, I'm really excited about this. I turned this in. I just wanted you, you know, to meet you um, before you get a chance to review this. I love that you said this. Um because literally this is where the receptionist is your best friend Yes. to pick up the phone call, make a phone call to the main number and just say, Hey, I'm X, Y, Z, you know, from this organization, 
who would you recommend that I chat with? Yep. I think a lot of times, you know, there's like com complete surprise and shock that you can get the information that quickly. Yeah, it, it's, it's not as hard as people think. You yeah. just have to do a couple extra steps. Right. You know, um, I think too, and I'd love to get your the thoughts on this, Amanda, and this is kind of like one of those woo woo questions, but I feel like this is more fear based than actually process based, meaning folks are afraid to pick up the phone. Folks are afraid to, it, it's just easier to send an email or submit everything up through the portal and then just sit back. What do you say about that? What do you think? I mean, I think some of that is COVID, right? But we, we've okay. also conditioned ourselves to be electronic. Um, yeah. However, humans have an innate nature to connect. And uh, I think rejection mm -hmm. is right up there. You know, that fear of rejection um, certainly probably play, plays a role in that. But as someone who would complete the application or, you know, wait to see if we got funded, I would rather have that rejection up front so that I don't take the time to complete the application um, rather yeah. than just sitting and waiting and getting an email that says, you know, thank you, you do great work, just not a fit this year. Um, that could save more heartache. I love that. I had never thought of that, but I think that that is an emotionally intelligent way to look at it. <laughs> and I think if you, if you, if you need an, an additional incentive, it's time. Yeah, it's time absolutely. spent. I mean, what you just said is magical. It's like, hey, look, you're going to you're going to invest yourself emotionally so much more if you go through this arduous process. And then it's like a don't fit next. Right. Yep. It's like that's brutal. So, yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. Let's talk about this next question. And this is an interesting thing. Um, and, I, and I'm just so curious, like what your opinion is. Can part-time grant writing, and I use the word structure, so I mean, is it a contractor or somebody in your office or, or whatever, can they be successful or do you need to like pull back and not attempt this until you have a, a full-time directed, committed person, professional on this? You know, everything that I do is part-time, if you will. So um, I like to think of it like a fractional director of development role. That's kind of Smart. the contract basis that I work mm -hmm. on with my clients and, mm -hmm. and fractional employees are becoming really popular, especially <laughs> with people moving during COVID mm -hmm. and a lot of folks wanting to work from home. Mm -hmm. And so I find it to be great. Um, mm -hmm. When I started my business back in 2021, I was leery. You know, they always tell you when you go out to business, uh, don't quit your full-time job until you yeah. replace your income. That was probably mm -hmm. the worst advice I ever got. <laughs> because I found that like, if there's a true need and it's your passion, um, jump in because there's plenty of folks that need your, your help and your support. And I'm all for contract work with this. I think, um, okay. it behooves the, the client so that they, you know, can identify exactly what they need. Um, but also helps diversify. So they don't need me to be a full-time director of development writing grants. Mm -hmm. They need to have someone that's doing the other fundraising, the events, the capital mm -hmm. campaigns, and mm -hmm. then supplementing that with the grants. And I think too many mm -hmm. people want to heavy on the grants and not enough on the other fundraising components. Yeah. Interesting. You know, I, I love that you use that word fractional because we're seeing that and everything from accounting services to HR yep. to marketing. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And I think um, I think that's a fascinating way to leverage a lot of talent um, and still kind of spread your budget across uh, to, to many different professions, right? Well, and in addition to that, I have found that people that work in the same uh categories, if you will, like the social services categories, mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. human services, the criminal justice. Mm -hmm. um, what I have found is I am able to connect those different clients together for one application. Mm -hmm. And so we're increasing the collaboration that's happening in our community. Mm -hmm. We're dividing the cost of completing mm -hmm. the project amongst other people. And 
uh, more people are getting funded that way. Mm -hmm. So in Billings, where I am, where I do a lot of our work, it is based in Yellowstone County. We have the largest per capita of nonprofits in our area. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what Arizona is like, but Montana is very heavy on completing uh, a lot of government or social type of work through nonprofits mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. for profit agencies yeah. or government agencies. Right. And so I'm able to connect those organizations and we create a comprehensive plan of attack um, that supplements, you know, strengths and weaknesses amongst the organizations. And that always helps because there's always a collaboration and partnership piece yeah. in almost every grant application or or RFP that we complete. So I find yeah. that those fractional um, workload can help multiple organizations at the same time for one project. Yeah. You know, I see that. I love that you just said that because I see one of the, the biggest trends in funding um, really started about 10 years ago. What, and I, I think for what I was seeing, at least, and that is a call to collaborate. Funders Absolutely. saying, you know, we're not going to just take one group. We, we have a social problem here and we have a mission. And and sometimes it, that collaboration causes, you know, more stress than anything else because in the nonprofit sector, we're always afraid of who's stealing our cheese, right? Yep. And so um, to even, I've seen arts organizations where completely different art forms were required to uh, collaborate, pull together something. And, you know, you'd have a ballet company say, well, that's not how we do it to the opera company. And the opera company would say to the art museum, well, that's not how we do it. I mean, it was just, but I think it's a healthy thing, right? I think it's a, it's a good yes. thing. And if funders are pushing this, which I think is only going to grow. Um, we need to be aware of this. And I think it also creates a whole nother level of management from, you know, uh, memos of understanding and, and MOU contracting and, and agreements that are set up beforehand, which grant administrators, you know, often have to get involved in because maybe it hasn't been done with these organizations. So right. that's another topic, but um, <laughs> I think it's an, it's a very interesting thing that you bring up. Before we let you go, I want to talk about what is the average grant win rate and what do you see? Because I feel like we think, oh, you know, we're going to get this or they hated us. Like we have these like weird notions about how the arc of success looks like. And mathematically, there's something going on here. What should we be looking at? Yeah, so studies say anywhere from 20 to 40 percent, it kind of depends on who you ask, is what the win rate is. Okay. Uh, not a whole lot different when you're talking about traditional fundraising. You know, when you create your depth chart for a capital campaign, you need so many of each level. So it, it's not a ton different, although people think that that, that grants are unique. Um, one of my strategies is making sure that we do that quality assurance beforehand. So we actually, um, depending on the year, range 78 to 86% success rate on our grants that we do mm -hmm. through Stone Rock Business Solutions. And so we feel like we have a pretty good rate, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, but yeah, traditionally 20 to 40% is considered good. And I think that, um, if people take the time to do the relationship building, if they take the time to make sure that they're responding to absolutely everything necessary, um, creating time ahead of time, don't wait till the last minute. Like there's a lot of strategies that they can do to increase their rate, but even then there's so many organizations out there that are doing good things. And, and it doesn't mean we're not, it doesn't mean that you are not. It just means that someone fit into that priority or had a relationship beforehand. And I think that's the key right. piece of it. You know, Amanda, I think that it seems to me that when you understand this concept of a win rate and what it should look like, you know, the statistics of, of the process bearing out success or not, um, it seems like that, that probably should have been my first question to you, right? <laughs> like if, if you can level set what that expectation is, then I've got to believe it's a healthier environment and not so stressful, you know, versus this, this notion, like if I only win the lottery, then all my right. problems will be solved. And this, this grant is like winning the lottery, right? Um, can you talk a little bit about that, about how we 
need to be thinking about this? I mean, does if, if you're we're looking at a 20 to 40 percent win rate, does that mean that we need to take and apply for that many more grants? Or or what do you what's your recommendation? I don't think so. I okay. I I encourage organizations to target and um, do the front end work instead because it's actually less time less time to to create that structure. Um, I call it sustainability planning because that's the other thing. I could get you hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars in grants. What are you going to do when that grant cycle ends? A lot of these funders won't let you uh, reapply for a, a period of time. Or if it's an RFP contract, you know, they end after a certain period of time. And so it's that, that legwork, that quality assurance, um, that really streamlines the process and sets them up for success. And it costs the client less money in the long run to do that. Um, it, it's kind of a hard sell. You know, I, I'm going to do a bunch of work. You're not going to get any money out of it. But mm -hmm. in the long run, we are going to be better at the applications that we do submit. It will increase. You know, we'll spend that time. Maybe the grant isn't the right route for you, but you'll have that relationship built so that maybe they can do a capital contribution as opposed to going through their funding cycle. Um, so that diversification and sustainability process sometimes is a hard sell, but I feel like we've had good success with being transparent and upfront. Mm -hmm. I never tell a client, I guarantee you, you will get this, even if I've been awarded that particular grant several times with a different organization. I always mm. tell them it, nothing is 100 right. percent, just like your lottery example. <laughs> well, I love that you said that, because I think that really is a great way to wrap up this conversation. Um, it's not it's not easy money that falls from the sky. Right. And I think in the media, we hear about these big donations, these, these, you know, major gifts, these transformational gifts. And it's like, wow, that's happening every day. And the reality is in, in this country, 1.8 million nonprofits, we have like the school teachers and the plumbers and the ministers and, you know, homemakers giving 10 bucks at a time. Right. And that's really the lifeblood of so many organizations. Exactly. And so th this huge windfall is really, I think, a myth um, in so many ways. But, it, you know, maybe it's just human nature. It's just we just think, oh, this is this is the salvation that we need to find. And um, but it's a brutal, brutal process because of disappointment. Um, shoot. You got to check out that Chronicle of Philanthropy um, op-ed. It, yeah, it's really like I said, it's heartbreaking. Um, and you can see the pitfalls of this individual and, and their mindset and what they went through. Um, and I think it's really a cautionary tale for so many of us. And so to, you know, we book our guests out far in advance and Amanda didn't know, I and mean, we, we booked you out. And then of course, you know, I read this in the Chronicle of Philanthropy and I was just like, holy moly, this is such an important piece of, of the whole grant puzzle. And so it's been just a delight to have you on and to learn from you. Um, I've really, really enjoyed enjoyed this. Amanda Stonerock, CEO and founder of Stonerock Business Solutions, based in the amazing community of Billings. And you can check out Amanda, learn more about her team and her work at Stone, <clears throat> easy for me to say, stonerockmt.com. So super cool, Amanda. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me and I'll continue to follow up with you and yeah. everything that you're doing. I appreciate what you're doing and trying to spread the word and educate people. It's just awesome. Thank you. It's never a dull moment on the nonprofit show. We have all different types of people coming on talking about all different things. I learned something new every day. I'm truly inspired every day. Um, I, I was talking to you in the green room and, you know, we've done more than 1100 shows for five years now and you would think I'd get tired um, and just be like, ah, but you know, truly every day. Um, wow. Amazing things going on uh, in our country and all different types of things, people that have amazing passion and, and really work hard. And um, it's incredibly profound. It really is. And 
you know, I think your work, you might not be in my community, but ultimately your work makes my community stronger, right? So, I mean, it, it, we all do row in the same direction, even though we're in different parts of this country. So I say thank you. I say thank you very much, very much. I also want to say thank you to our amazing sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, <coughs> pardon me, your part-time controller, Fundraisers Friday, our new Friday episodes, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that are with us day in and day out. As we end every episode of the Nonprofit Show, we leave with this message, and it goes like this. It's simple, but it's kind of complicated to stay well so you can do well. Amanda, thanks so much.